So this whole issue of herd immunity is sort of like the last little bastion of argument. But what about the herd? What about public health? What about the herd? Well, the real issue is that there was herd immunity a long time ago. And there was a natural herd immunity that was actually very, a very good thing that really did protect people. But now with vaccination, we've changed everything. So these are the assumptions that are behind the vaccine industry. Everyone is susceptible and everyone will be exposed to every one of those vaccine preventable pathogens. And of course, on the same day, just like how we give all the vaccines, you're gonna see hepatitis B, Hib, rotavirus, chickenpox, measles, mumps, rubella, you know, all on the same day. That's why we have to vaccinate you on the day, same day. And 13 strains of Prevnar and all that stuff. So everyone's gonna be exposed. And if you're exposed, you're gonna get sick. And not only are you gonna get sick, you're gonna get worst case scenario sick. You're never going to have like one little bump of chicken pox or you're never going to have, you know, just just a, a, like a tiny little rash from measles. You're going to die if you get those vaccine presentable illnesses, because, unless, of course, you're vaccinated and then you're not susceptible anymore. And not only are you not going to die, you're not even going to ever get sick. Those are the premises of the entire industry. That's the way they think. That's what's been indoctrinated over and over and over again. I mean, what is this thing that we keep hearing about? That if we stop vaccinating, oh, the herd, everybody's gonna die because they're gonna be susceptible because they're not vaccinated. Well, herd immunity is the presence of adequate immunity within a population against a specific infection, which brings up another really important point. And we've been talking about this up here, and we talk about it a lot in my class, that we were changing the language to stop talking about measles, mumps, rubella as a disease. Because disease sounds so scary to new parents. Oh, you want them to get those diseases, do you? We need to change that language and just talk about infections. Everybody's had an infection. They've had a sinus infection, a bladder infection. They've had an infection on their fingers. So you've taken down the fear factor that now we're talking about infections. We're not talking about diseases. So how did we come to accept herd immunity as the reason that we must accept that mass vaccination? If we want to keep in a population controlled basis, how did that suddenly get translated over to everyone is susceptible and everyone must be vaccinated? This is what natural or real herd immunity was all about. And it really did happen that when infants that are less than six months of age can be susceptible to infections that can be serious, particularly pertussis, even measles at a very young age in an vitamin A deficient population like that you see in third world countries that they really are more susceptible to a serious illness. But if mothers had had the real infection when they were growing up at the age appropriate time of like nine to 10 to 11 years of age, they had the infection and this is key in the presence of fever. How important is fever in terms of, of, of processing pathogens and being able to maintain your long-term immunity and health? So those mothers who experienced that real childhood illness pass that natural protection to their infants through both the placenta and the breath milk. That was real natural herd immunity. And that passive immunity protected infants through their highest vulnerable periods of somewhere between one and six months. Those real antibodies that had been developed against real pathogens in a real human who experienced a real infection in the presence of fever. So they activated both their Th1, their macrophages, their Th1 pathways and their Th2 pathways for the long-term immunity. And then by one year of age, those infants could mount their own response. So if they were exposed to measles, mumps, rubella, chickenpox, any of those things, they could mount their own response, experience their infection on their own, have a fever, and be just fine and have a lifetime of immunity. That was really herd immunity. As you had like 67% of the population, about two thirds of the population, who had really experienced the real infection, that would stop the transmission of those pathogens from one person to another and would, ex it would, it would um, protect the persons in the extremes, the very young and the very old. So herd immunity used to be a real thing. I'm wanting to make a distinction between real natural herd immunity and medical immunity. Vaccination came along and changed everything. All these vaccines led to a loss of natural protection amongst infants. And there are lots of studies in the medical literature that talk about that they look at the antibodies in breast milk of mothers that had been vaccinated for measles versus mothers who had actually experienced the measles. And the antibodies are not the same. 
the mothers who had had the real infection have a higher concentration that lasted longer and had a better affinity for the virus than the antibodies that are passed through the breast milk of mothers who'd been vaccinated. The other thing is that there's this waning antibody coverage that these vaccine-induced antibodies for measles last somewhere between 10 and 12 years. Rubella is 12 years, and all the other antibodies from all the other vaccines are much less. So when we started doing all this massive vaccination, which actually really started in the 1960s but got heavy-handed starting in 1991, we changed everything. Where did this concept first come about? It was a long time ago. Herd immunity first came into our consciousness in 1923, almost 100 years ago, with the first time that that was used in a medical paper in 1923. And then this is the cornerstone, this is the seminal study that happened in 1930. This was a physician who was in, the, it was in Massachusetts who followed, who did an observational study of measles data collected between 1900 and 1930. 30 years he, he followed this. And what he concluded was that when 55%, a little more than half, um, or more than that, had had real measles in children under 15 years of age, the outbreak stopped, that stopped the transmission, and it appeared as though the lack of transmission protected the herd who had contracted measles. 55% to 60% needed to have the real infection in real natural herd immunity, but what does the vaccine industry say we need to have in terms of a vaccination rate to have herd immunity? 95, 97%, something like that, because it doesn't work because it doesn't work. But that's a really, 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 that's the seminal paper. That's the, that's, the, that's the place where this started back in 1930. And then this is where the language started to change. In 1936, Greenwood had a textbook, the textbook of epidemic and crowd disease referred to herd immunity, one of the earliest appearances in a medical textbook. And this is where the language started to get really fuzzy when they started talking about immune meaning vaccinated. Not immune because I'd had the real infection and I had recovered and my whole body has a lifetime of immunity, but immune started to mean vaccinated and unimmune or not immune meant to be susceptible were the, were the unvaccinated. And this is the other landmark study that is really important in terms of cornerstone stuff about herd immunity. And this came out in 1971. And, the, and so, so I want to read this and then we'll break it down just real quickly. The purpose of an immunization program is to reduce the su supply of susceptibles, meaning vaccinated, to such an extent that the probability of spreading an illness is very small. But no matter how large the number of the vaccinated population is, there'll be some little pockets of unvaccinated people out there that are susceptible that could blow up into some big epidemic. 1971, now compare that to measles in 2014. Oh, it was those unvaccinated little susceptibles around there that created the 663 people that got sick and raising epidemics. Because we started talking about vaccinated, meaning being immune, not healthy, being able to resist infection. That started in 1971 and has continued, it hasn't stopped. So that's where this all comes from. So if you know a little bit about the historical fact of where, how we got here, you'll understand the, how, this, how this is all planted into people's brains. Then the other thing that they said is that the only way that medical herd immunity or vaccination really works is if it breaks the chain of transmission. So you get a vaccine, you get an antibody, and you're around sick people, it, the antibody will stop some of that transmission, which is another long discussion, but that's where this whole argument comes from. Except that many of the vaccines we get don't even follow that particular mode of thinking that medical herd immunity does not apply to most vaccines. I mean, you get a hepatitis B vaccine, how can you not spread something you don't already have? And the toxoid, the tetanus vaccine, diphtheria and pertussis, they protect the person ostensibly who's been vaccinated, but that does nothing for the herd, nothing. And oral polio vaccines has live viruses, so I get a whole oral polio, I can shed that virus to somebody else. So I'm not stopping the transmission of infection, I'm actually inducing the, the transmission. The rotavirus, the same thing. Chicken pox and the shingles vaccine can both shed viruses. And flu mist, which is one of the vaccines that they removed and now they brought it back, it spreads live viruses for up to 21 days according to the package insert. There's a big difference between natural herd immunity and medical herd immunity. 
With natural herd immunity, immune means recovered. Healthy people aren't harborers of infection that they can just spread to everybody.